Hey there, I'm Andrew Chang. Welcome to About That, the show where we're all about explaining and expanding on the news. And on today's show, we want to talk a little bit about Bitcoin. So how it works and whether it might ever become a stable currency. So I, I remember reading this, this really great uh, Matt Levine article on Bloomberg a while ago, and it made this really interesting point about how all of our lives are just entries in a database somewhere. So like when you get paid, it's just numbers moving across a bank database from your employer to your bank account. When you spend money, you're just kind of like pushing those numbers around some more. Even when you buy a, like a house, transferring ownership, yes, you now have uh, the keys to the house, right? And, and you alone can come and go as you please. But more important than the key is that piece of paper, the, the ownership deed that states that, for the record, you are the owner. So even if someone like breaks into your house or even gets a hold of your key and, and moves in, it doesn't actually change who owns the house, right? All just entries in a database somewhere. Now, for that whole system to work, you need a lot of trust, right? Like, you need to trust the bank holding your money that they'll keep their numbers straight. You need to trust the government that your title deed actually means something. But it's a bit of a mess, isn't it? Like, you know, just with banking alone, you've got lots of different databases and, and lots of different people who run them. And all of those people make money from your money. They ding you with fees, or worse, maybe they they lose your money altogether. Or, you know, their systems get hacked and your personal information gets compromised. Well, what if there was one database to rule them all? And instead of just one entity running it, everyone did. Well, it turns out that such a database exists in the world of Bitcoin. Now, if we agree that money, for the most part, exists simply as numbers flying around on spreadsheets, it's not that big of a stretch to see Bitcoins the same way. Okay, let's talk about Bitcoin. Bitcoins are just arbitrary bits of data created by some dude conjured out of thin air. But unlike this Chang coin that I just created 10 minutes ago in MS Paint, Bitcoin is based on a mathematical foundation that gives it much more potential to be an actual currency than Chang coin. And I'm going to use those differences to hopefully show you how Bitcoin actually works. So the first problem with Chang coin, and believe me, there are many, <laughs> is that there's nothing stopping anyone from just copying it. I mean, like I could do that right now, just, just copy, paste, send, bing, bang, boom, and all of a sudden I've got two identical Chang coins. Now this is what we call too much of a good thing. <laughs> Actually, we call it the double spend problem. Now, banks and companies like Venmo or PayPal, they solve this problem by being the gatekeepers, right? They control all of the accounts and all transactions go through them in private. But with Bitcoin, all transactions happen in public. Now, your identity is kept secret, but the fact that, say, wallet number 12 just sent three Bitcoins to wallet number 393, that's all recorded in a public database. And not just one database, it's actually spread out in identical versions across the entire Bitcoin network. It's completely decentralized. And this is really important because if I try to spend Bitcoin that I don't have, it's essentially my word, my records against the entire system. And this rule by consensus is critical. And it's why it's almost impossible to make counterfeit coins records that don't line up with everyone else's are rejected. And this is the so-called blockchain inaction. So imagine every transaction being checked and rechecked and verified and re-verified by thousands of users, then getting bundled into these blocks and each block combining to form a long permanent chain, each one permanently building on the block before it. Changcoin doesn't have anything like this. And those crazy Bitcoin mining farms that we constantly hear about, those computers are actually the ones doing the legwork of processing all the transactions and making sure that every single transaction matches up with every single other. They keep the system running and they keep it honest. Now, it is incredibly demanding work. The process of creating Bitcoins to spend or trade consumes around 91 terawatt hours of electricity every year. That's more power than the entire country of Finland uses each and every year. But this work 
is also pretty lucrative because Bitcoin miners get paid with every successive block that they add to the chain. And fun fact, this is how new Bitcoins are actually made, conjured out of thin air and released only on a set schedule, trickling out with a total of 21 million coins in circulation by the year 2140. Then, no more new coins. Okay, back to Chang coin. Another big problem with this is that it can be intercepted pretty easily, right? Like if I'm on a public Wi-Fi, some sufficiently clever person could intercept my coin while it's in transit and do all kinds of nasty things to it. This is where the crypto of cryptocurrency comes in. Even if you intercept the message, you don't gain anything because it's encoded in a way that won't make any sense to you and it's impossible to break the code. Now, maybe you're wondering, wait, how could a code be impossible to break? Like there's always a key, right? Well, if you don't believe me, let me give you a really simple example. Now, imagine that I have a very secret combination of sock pairs that I wanna keep hidden, but I'm gonna show it to you. So first I take two black socks, then I take two white socks, then I take a black and a white. Don't worry, this will, this will make sense in a moment. A black and a white. And finally, another black and white. Now here's the fun part. I'm going to encode my secret combination so that every time I take two black socks, as shown here, I'm gonna write the number one. If I take two white socks, I'm gonna write the number two. Then when I do a black and a white, I'm gonna say that's a one. So we do another one here, and then another black and white, that's another one. There you go. So my code representing my socks is one, two, one, one. Now, even if you intercept that code, you have no way of decrypting it, even if you know how the code works, because Every time you see a one, it's impossible for you to know if that means two black socks or one of each. Like was my first pair of socks all black or was it one black, one white? Who knows? As far as codes go, it's unbreakable. Now, this is just a really simple, really silly example. And you might ask, what good is a code that nobody can decode? Well, that's a great question. but. This is where you'll kind of just have to take at face value that Bitcoin's cryptography is far more sophisticated, far more complex than my SOC cryptography because there are actually multiple codes and a combination of public codes like my method for encoding SOCs that I've just shared with you and private codes which are unique to every individual Bitcoin holder. And they all work together such that only those people with the right public and private codes can be part of any specific transaction. It's almost as if like every Bitcoin holder has a different secret handshake for every other person they might ever trade Bitcoin with. And unless you know my code to my wallet, you never have enough pieces of the overall code to do me any harm. Put another way, if I open my wallet in front of you and pull out a coin, you have no way of reaching into my wallet to pull out some more. Now, there are plenty of reasons why Changcoin will never and should never take off, but maybe the biggest reason it would never work is that we'd never get the world to agree to trust it because it's stupid and, and it doesn't share any of the same mathematical foundation as Bitcoin. There's not enough people out there who would buy it. And that is where we find ourselves at a bit of a crossroads with Bitcoin. Now, it has been on a wild ride since its creation. It makes my head hurt just trying to keep up. At one point, 2021, the price of one Bitcoin skyrocketed to over $60,000 US. That was an eightfold increase within just a year or so. And a few weeks after that, it crashed by half. Bitcoin's value can be incredibly volatile from one day to the next, but there's no doubt that you will always find proponents who believe that Bitcoin, either as an investment or as an actual currency, is here to stay. 
So that's Bitcoin in a nutshell. But, but let's pick up with the difference between Bitcoin as an investment and Bitcoin as a currency. So right now it's overwhelmingly the former, right? Like, like mainly just a, a lot of speculators riding the wave. But it is absolutely to a currency. So about a year and a half ago, El Salvador became the first country in the world to adopt Bitcoin as legal tender. Now, has it replaced the US dollar there, you know, which is mainly what people use? No, not a chance, nowhere close. And, and there's actually a lot of pushback there. El Salvador's national debt load is really risky, so you know, vulnerable to default. And betting the farm on one of the most volatile assets on the planet maybe isn't a good thing, especially in a country where lots of people don't even have internet access. But it's still trying. You know, there are crypto ATMs sprinkled in various parts of El Salvador, hundreds of them. Um, Australia is a big player in that space too. So is Nigeria, uh, Spain as well. But maybe the biggest out in the open examples of Bitcoin as currency kind of happen on a company by company basis. So you can actually buy a Whopper at some Burger Kings around the world using Bitcoin. On Twitch, you can pay your favorite video game streamers using Bitcoin. Or you could buy tickets to a, a Dallas Mavericks game or a, a movie at an AMC theater or a cheap flight on Norwegian Air all using Bitcoin. Pizza Hut, Newegg, Wikipedia, uh, even big companies like AT&T, uh, Microsoft, and Tesla, they've all flirted with or are currently accepting Bitcoin as payment. But it's still a long way off from being mainstream or the norm, right? Like, like I mean, how, how many people do you know who use Bitcoin to buy things? So we're gonna come back after the break with someone who thinks the age of Bitcoin is coming. We'll see you in a couple minutes. Hey, welcome back to About That. I'm joined by my friend Gray Williams right now to talk about Bitcoin. Uh, Gray, how are you doing? Doing really well. It's a beautiful day out there. Yeah. And, and so, so you're a, a tech writer, podcaster, kind of our go-to on, on all of this stuff, especially cryptocurrency, which we've talked about before. And, and actually, you've have you held Bitcoin like ever? Yes. Yeah. Like right from actually almost the very beginning, um, one of the first Bitcoin uh, parts of Bitcoin that I, that I uh, mined was through a Bitcoin faucet. There's a website where you put in your Bitcoin address and it sends you Bitcoin for free, which nowadays sounds like a scam, but Back then, they were desperate to get people to use Bitcoin for anything, starting with pizza. <laughs> so, so it's funny because it's true, right? I mean, Bitcoin faucets, they've been around for an awfully long time, even today. And, and, and basically, the way they work is you, you just go online, you, you do these little tasks. So sometimes it's solving CAPTCHAs, sometimes it's watching ads, other times it could even be like playing a little video game and you get paid for doing it in Bitcoin. Now, as Gray was saying, the main purpose of these faucets sort of way back when was just to generate interest in Bitcoin because back then it was worth virtually nothing. Now, for these faucets to be actually worthwhile to run, the amount of money generated from you watching the ad has to offset the cost of Bitcoins that they pay you in. Right, right yes, okay, so here's the bigger question. Have you ever used Bitcoin to actually buy something? Yes. Yeah. Um, so I, I bought some art online. Um, I also bought services, Proton Mail. I actually pay for with Bitcoin uh, fairly regularly. I paid for hosting services and uh, and VPN. Okay. So so here's why I'm asking that because the thing I don't get about like Bitcoin potentially being used as actual currency is that its value is just like all over the map right like so so if i if i decide okay today i'm gonna buy like a hot dog for for a bitcoin but tomorrow maybe that same bitcoin like would buy me a car like like how is that supposed to function as currency i, I think so there's a that's a really great question and the idea here that you know you're going to perhaps lose out because bitcoin is going to skyrocket in value at any given moment i think has been challenging for a lot of people to uh you know basically use as a day-to-day -day currency. Um, when I was looking at this, essentially what I was doing was taking fiat currency that day, buying Bitcoin with that, and then going and making the purchase. So for me, it was sort of a one-to-one -one each time I used it. And that sort of was a way that I found some stability in Bitcoin. 
Looking at some other things, though, Bitcoin, when you take a look at comparison to the you know, S&P 500 and other stock markets, it's actually more stable than a lot of stocks out there. So if you're putting money into stocks, you know, they can have the same sort of volatility that you'd see in Bitcoin. So we're not really like we're not unaccustomed to this kind of risk. Yeah, like like certainly not this kind of risk when it comes to the dollars and cents that I spent, right? Like, and I, I don't know, like, I, am I am I just wrong to be kind of hung up on the value of of Bitcoin and how it changes so often? Because like like even like dollars and cents, I mean, they're they're really liquid too, right? Like you, you can just change them for different currencies, and and you know when when different people buy and sell dollars and cents, it doesn't. <laughs> it doesn't cause this roller coaster ride in the value of dollars and cents, but with Bitcoin, it it feels that way. So I, I don't know. I'm just trying to imagine how this actually works, or or maybe it doesn't. Like like, what do you think? Does does it work as currency? Well, when I when I talk to you know sort of Bitcoin maximalists, the people who believe that Bitcoin is the only cryptocurrency and the only way to go, when I've talked to them about this, what they've said to me is that one Bitcoin is worth one Bitcoin. And the fluctuations in value come in comparison to other currencies. And so they're saying that, you know, if we have services in the market that are priced in Bitcoin, in Satoshis, uh, the value shouldn't fluctuate too much from day to day. And that is, that's, I mean, that's a huge sea change from how uh, things, things are done right now. Uh, but looking at it, we've had sea changes in how we conduct commerce, you know, going back to the island of Delos where, you know, commerce was really invented and currencies were invented. So... Like we can get through this, um, and maybe that Bitcoin is the way to go. And they're saying, you know, one Bitcoin's worth one Bitcoin, so don't really worry about these other currencies because you're going to be able to transact uh, in this one. What about um, security, right? Like, so so one thing that that we've been learning about with Bitcoin is that it works on this kind of consensus model, right, to to track transactions, and it seems terrifying to me that if anyone entity, organization, group of people, or country were able to control 51% of the nodes processing transactions, like, man, does that cause a problem, no? It, it, it sounds like that could be a relatively easy thing to do, but it's not, right? This is almost like taking control of 51% of the internet. As soon as you start to spin up more miners, and as soon as people started to see that, there is a lag time in between, you know, when you start to spin these things up and when you would have control of the network. Um, basically, folks looking at how Bitcoin is administered right now wouldn't let that happen. Um, you know, and I, that's, I, I say that tentatively because looking back at things like FTX and looking back at things like Terra Luna, you know, these were systems where these things probably should not have happened. But Bitcoin, this is right into the, you know, architected source code of Bitcoin. It's it's very hard to do a 51% attack. Okay, now, now Gray is saying that pulling off a 51% online attack would be almost impossible to do. But what about pulling off a 51% physical attack where you have your own machines trying to overpower the network? Well, I looked it up because I was curious. And, and I don't actually understand a lot of the technical details, but from the estimates that I see, like just in energy consumption alone, that kind of an attack, a physical attack, would take like four and a half gigawatts of electricity, which is a lot. It, it sort of immediately limits this to powerful nation states working in conjunction with energy companies in order to, to pull off that kind of an attack. And then there's like billions of dollars in equipment alone. And speaking of equipment, that would not be easy to get, like to get a hold of, because un unless you were able to sort of magically commandeer all of the existing Bitcoin network infrastructure out there and then twist it to your purpose, there just aren't enough unused top of the line mining processors out there for you to, to pull this kind of thing off. It, it's sort of like if I said, go ahead and round up 51% of the world's guns. Like, how would you even do it? Um, there was a brief period where you know it looked like it might happen, but that was sort of looking ahead two years from then, this could be a thing that happens and uh, people took action against it. So that 51% attack, I don't think is a, is a, is a serious threat to, to Bitcoin. Um, you know, something like a flaw in the code somewhere that we have not found yet could be, but that seems highly unlikely at this point. So, so in your mind, then, I mean, you you sound sort of convinced that you know, you, you know, maybe with that ten-year timeline, Bitcoin 
could have what it takes to to become a stable currency. What are the pros to that? Like, like why do you why do you think that'll happen? And is that a good thing? I mean, personally, I think that digital currencies are a good thing for us. Um, you know, trying tying our the value of assets to something in the physical world, um, you know, has worked in the past, but we've already seen banks stepping away from that. So why keep this model around? Um, you know, looking at what Bitcoin has done in the last uh, decade, we've seen some amazing improvements in the technology. We've seen things like Ethereum pushing Bitcoin further and when we have things like you know central bank digital currencies start to roll out, the competition is going to be compared to Bitcoin, and I think Bitcoin really fundamentally got it right. And so all of these mm -hmm. technologies that we've added on, Lightning Network and, and other ways of processing transactions, we're going to see more of that. And Bitcoin really does have a first mover advantage in a very big way. So basically looking at any other cryptocurrency right now on the market and seeing what it could do in comparison to Bitcoin. You know, smaller players can move more quickly, but that rock solid base that Bitcoin has, the community that's around it all around the world, it's going to be a, a, a tough thing to beat. Uh, Gray Williams, I gotta leave it there, but always a pleasure to chat with you. Thanks so much. Good chatting. Hey there, welcome back to About That. So, you know, for the last little while, I've been tracking the price of Bitcoin, not just over, you know, the last few days and weeks, but over the last several months and even years. And so, you know, over the last six months, Bitcoin has been kind of hovering at this, uh, you know, $20,000 Canadian per coin mark, which, you know, if you haven't been following the price of Bitcoin probably sounds crazy to you, unless, until rather, you realize that in the six months prior to the last six months, Bitcoin actually was at around $80,000 per coin. And then in the years before that, it was an absolute steal at $1,000 a coin. So, you know, what does the future hold for, you know, something like Bitcoin as a currency? Well, you know, I think one important thing to realize is that Bitcoin isn't actually the be all and end all of cryptocurrency. It's just the one that we focused on today because we wanted to look at the technology that underpins it. But there are lots of different cryptocurrencies out there. You know, Ethereum is another big one. And there are different technologies that form the basis and the foundations of all of these different coins. So, you know, maybe Bitcoin is the, gonna be the one that ends up emerging as the leader and becoming an actual stable currency. Maybe it's Bitcoin 2.0, maybe it's Ethereum, or maybe it's some other coin that we haven't even heard of or that hasn't been invented yet, right? Like what platform is actually going to be stable enough for the world to use as a, as a means of, of exchanging for goods and services? One last thing for you. So, you know, as, as part of the research for this story, I actually created an account on a uh, cryptocurrency exchange to buy Bitcoin. And when you're creating the account, they give you a big warning, two big things that they tell you before you can do anything. One, that investing in cryptocurrency, it is a highly speculative investment. And two, that if you invest, you could lose all of your money. Thanks for joining us here on About That. It's been a lot of fun. We'll see you tomorrow.